Hi, this is Jason Hyman with Schmidt Custom Floors, Athletic Flooring Manager. I'm here today to talk to you guys about some cleaning procedures and tips, troubleshooting, and some things that we do for cleaning gymnasiums. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me, feel free to give me a call at 262-269-8045, or you can email me at j-h-e-i-m-a-n at schmidtflooring.com. I'm going to talk to you guys about some cleaning maintenance ideas, thoughts for when you guys clean gyms. Um, I wanted to show you and give you a couple of things that may help you in some of the uh, procedures that I'm showing you. Um, none of this is the way it has to be done. Uh, I think I told you before, this is all about a process that we've adopted. I'm not here to sell you a product, to push anything down your throat in that regard. Um, we represent two of the big names in the state of Wisconsin, Connor Sports Flooring and Tarquette Sports Flooring. Two of the biggest names as far as wood flooring and synthetic flooring worldwide pretty much. Um, we do a, a whole lot of refinishing in the state of Wisconsin, one of them being where we're at, Alverno College. Um, but with that being said, um, we want to create a scenario where there's not any bias, right? And in our industry, which you may not be aware of, there has been a consistent and a couple of them have dropped off and gotten back in over time. But there is what's called the MFMA. You may be familiar with them. The MFMA is the Maple Flooring Manufacturers Association. And what they are is essentially the only authoritative source to wood maple flooring. Not wood flooring, maple flooring, right? Why is that important? It's important because there's only six manufacturers that have made almost every gym floor we've ever seen in our lifetime. For example, Connor Sports Flooring has been in business since the 1800s, right? It's important because the MFMA comes out with guidelines, strict standards as far as slipperiness, which we call coefficient of friction. Um, how good does a ball return if it's bouncing? Why is the paint fracturing? Humidity recommendations. Can you use a walk-behind scrubber? Why is the paint starting to break? all the things that are sort of different from job to job to job and quite literally even jobs that'll have say six gyms in a school district the one down the hall is not the same as the one we're on it all has to do with evolution how much time we've dealt with that gym how many coats of finish on it when was it done what time of year for example if you install a floor in in august in wisconsin you're going to have high humidity and you're going to expect it to be low humidity in winter that first year is critical, right? Because the floor is going to move the most it ever will in its entire life, usually in the first 12 to 18 months, right? Um, so it's critical to know this manufacturer's association from an owner's standpoint, maintenance standpoint, and a contractor's standpoint. Because in the unlikely event there's an issue that you want to resolve, you have somebody unbiased that can essentially say to you, we, we did our job appropriately, or this is what caused something, right? So what they come out with, and you can see this, this is just a basic format of some things that they require or request as far as cleaning the gym floor. It's nice to hang in the maintenance closet, taking care of your maple floor, and you guys can take some of these with you. Um, pretty generic. You know, most finished manufacturers are going to give you the same information, right? Essentially telling you if you think you can just load the floor with water cleaning it, it's not going to work out too well for anyone. Um, and then how to clean up spots and so on. Um, I think one of the missing links and keys to our industry that most people are not aware of are what the MFMA does an awesome job at representing. And what, what they are is what's called position statements. So the MFMA has a website. You know, unlike other manufacturers associations where you have thousands of opinions, you sort of have all of it funneled down into one opinion on why something's happening. So if you go to their website, it's maplefloor.org. There's a section on there called position statements. And what they are, for example, here's one right here, and this is about the bulk of them. They're one-page sheets on everything we deal with. You go into a job, the finish is peeling and chipping. Okay? Well, in about four paragraphs, that explains pretty much solid why that floor is finishes peeling and chipping, right? Refinishing concerns. A contractor comes in and says, you need to refinish your floor every six months. 
It's not necessarily true. It's situational based on your use, right? Well, the MFMA helps you as far as understanding what you should re you know, expect. Um, why I think this is important is because you're not overloaded with specifications that are sort of way too much information. You're given a very straightforward answer on humidity. This is the expectation by every gym floor company in America, right? A um, couple other ones on here. You want to use a scissors lift, right? This gym floor is different than the gym down the street, than many other gym floors. There's a lot more to it than what, just what you see. Subfloor construction, its ability to maintain um, or be able to take overloaded deflection. Say if you had bleachers that were 30 feet high, those weigh a lot more than four or five feet high, right? So it takes into account all the subtleties and why things happen. Uh, quick example, if you had a 20 foot high bleacher set on a traditional floor made today and the bleachers are in the extended position and filled with people coming to watch a game, right? That whole floor is going to deflect or depress down, okay? If a contractor didn't put stop blocking underneath the floor, essentially what that does is the floor can depress a certain amount, hits the stop blocking, can't go anymore. You have a good scenario. Funny enough, things have fallen through the cracks in certain jobs, unnamed here, that that hasn't happened. But that might play a role, say, if you were to use a scrubber on a floor, that traditionally that would work on that floor, but in this floor it's not working because it's causing the floor to deflect too much, right? So it's really important to understand if you're having an issue as a, as a cleaning uh, company in different gyms, you know, if you have issues, what is it that you're, that's underneath what you're dealing with, right? It's a huge problem. Um, you, you probably can't see this right now on camera, but we talk about vertical deflection. You know, floors are made to have a certain amount of deflection up and down. And they're tested for performance requirements for if a ball bounces back and so on. If you have paint fracture or, or, or finish fracture, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes you can go up to a board, stand on it, and actually physically see it depressed next to the board next to it, right? One of the biggest position statements that unfortunately we have to deal with is paint fracture. So why is it happening? Well. Deflection, if you have a floor that was humid and the floor had taken on uh, or basically released moisture and you're going into the winter time of the year where it's cold and dry, that floor contracts. There's a one-page position statement on here that says paint, no matter who makes it, is not as elastic as finish. And if you have some fracture at those areas, it's almost always based on humidity, right? So I know we're here to talk about cleaning but it's a real important resource for you guys, especially as a cleaning company and an end user, that if you have issues with what anybody's saying to you, it's nice because there's, there's one guy essentially that would answer everyone's questions industry-wide. So that's a neat thing to know. Um, so you guys can take that with you when we're done. Um, what I'm gonna do is essentially show you the process we use, whether we do a cleaning demonstration uh, whether we do a screening coat, a cleaning coat, um, or just any kind of maintenance, it's the process we use as a company, right? It's pretty elementary, but the idea is to get it done quick, efficient, not use a lot of product, and not sell anything. So what I'm showing you here today, you pretty much can get anywhere you want, right? So I'm going to show you um, essentially the products we deal with. I'll bring them over there. What I always recommend pretty much any size gym is an empty five gallon bucket. If you're a maintenance company coming in, I would suggest if you have an area where stuff can be set, where it's your stuff that's here, you have an empty gallon bucket. Probably most situations, it's situational too, on how much of maintenance needs to be done to this regard. Um, based on what factors, are you walking directly in from outside? Do you have good rugs? Um, if a person has a rug, for example, we try to get it where a person has two steps per foot before they're on the floor. But it makes a difference where you're coming from. If you have to walk a half football field to get into the gym, chances are it's not going to accumulate as much as the gym where it's inside lobby gym, right? And those are the places that accumulate a lot quicker. Um, so your products are an empty five-gallon bucket, 
not brand conscious, and water to start with. And we like to say keep a bucket half full, and that should last you roughly with a normal size gym about a, about a week, right? And we use a process called wet tacking using towels. These towels are about $1.50. They're from Walmart. You can get them wherever you want. The most important thing, though, is, is that they're not heavy nap. If you have a nice thick towel, it's great if you get out of the shower, but that's not what we're trying to accomplish. We want a real thin nap on purpose in this setting so that it allows you to go across the floor easily, right? The next component, and I'm gonna show you, because this floor has a Bonakemi finish on it, I'm showing you Bonakemi's version of neutral cleaner, pH seven cleaner. There is no partiality on this, okay? You can use the cleaning company if you're in with 3M or use a particular company, it's okay. The things that are subtle differences though, some of them have quicker drying agents. So if you need to clean at half time and you want that floor to be dry quicker, make sure you ask the manufacturer what you're using. Bona does a good job of getting the product to dry fast, right? Um, and then the last component is a three foot push broom with a pretty heavy duty handle. The thinner handles will, will sort of bow or bend on you a little bit. And a soft bristle broom. It's really important. This one has a little stiffer in the middle, but at minimum, you want to have soft, at least on the outsides. Um, uh, and you'll see why in a second. So what I tell people in a typical cleaning day, we're used to using the dust mop, right? So what I'm going to represent, I'm going to take the dust mop and I'm going to pretend no matter the length of the gym, right? I'm going to go up and down like I normally would with the dust mop and then I'm going to go behind it using the cleaning method we use as contractors, all right? And you're going to see the process I deal with and we can ask some questions maybe after, all right? So traditionally, we're, we're all familiar with the dust mop, regardless of the brand. We're familiar with dust mop treatments, right? And it, 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 it holds a good value in any gymnasium when you have a lot of stuff to get. You have an event, there's cups or anything that's under a bleacher set, you want to get a lot done quickly. Or time is of the essence and you just got to get it done now, right? So I'm going to represent, we'll pretend, no matter the length of the gym, this is important, we're gonna pretend half court's the end of the gym, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up. Obviously, you know what I'm doing. I'm not teaching you how to use a dust mop here, but it's important that it was done before I show you what I'm doing, all right? Which comes into the process. You come into the gym, as a contractor or the school, you'll take your five gallon bucket, and this is in the closet now where your stuff is. You'll take your neutral cleaner, no matter the brand, this is extremely important. Over mixing does harm, does not do you good. So if a customer says that it's not working well, more cleaner will actually do a worse job, right? I have case examples of pretty high end division one basketball teams in the immediate area that have used the cleaner straight, thinking that they were doing a better job, and it was like an ice rink. So it's extremely important. If you run out of cleaner, you could use water, but it's obviously recommended to use the cleaner with the, with the water, right? This particular product in a five gallon concentrate is an eight to one ratio. Um, it's good to have some sort of method, but I've done it enough that I'm just gonna pour some in for sake of example. Um, so you would do this again in your maintenance closet. Okay. So you walked out from your maintenance closet. This is about 8,500 square foot gym. You're going to use maybe seven, eight towels total. Okay. You walk out, you have clean towels. Um, and you're going to come out and you're going to put your bucket in the most conducive area in the middle of the gym to where the best spot is in and out for you when you're done, right? So you pick what side that is, of course. Okay, take your towel. It works best, I know this is kind of elementary, it works best if it's folded, 
because it squeezes out a lot easier. Now, as neutral cleaner, a question may be, do I need to wear gloves? Is it hurting stuff in your hands? Neutral cleaner, cleaner I like to use the analogy. If I took this and spilled it all over myself right now, and it was my favorite shirt, it's not going to hurt it, right? That's not to say, because I'm on camera here, that you might not have a problem chemically somewhere there, but I've never had a problem with it. So it's, it's very um, non-abrasive from a chemical standpoint, right? So straightforward, dip it in the water. And I'm going to wring that out all the way. Now, the reason why I say half a bucket is even if this was 20,000 square feet, you're, very, you're using very little of this cleaner. Never put a dirty towel back in the cleaner, right? So that's sort of the process so that when you get done, over the course of a week, maybe you'd have to change out your cleaner again, but that's situational based on how many times you have to do this. It may last you a month, and there's a lot of schools that that little bit I use will last a month which makes it a very cheap and inexpensive process. So I'm going to start here, but I'm going to pretend that we're starting at the wall, right? But there's some obstructions. I'm going to start here. And this is where process comes into play. Take my broom, and I just start a little bit, and I want to step on it so my shoes aren't dirty. A good note, a lot of people will say, how abrasive can I be if I have marks, right? If I want to get marks out. Pretty much any finish, urethane oil modifieds, um, urethane water-based, even acrylic urethane water-based finishes can take about 30 seconds of this kind of abrasive with this kind of towel before it'll do anything. It probably wouldn't do anything if you did it for two minutes, but I like to say about 30 seconds. So you didn't have to bend over to do that. Of course, you don't want to do that all the time. But if you have a mark or a free throw lane or a concentrated area, you're really trying to do a good job, you can do that is the point, right? So I'm going to take the towel. Why do we like this? Yeah, it's three feet. I'm not doing a whole lot. But I don't have to be a, uh, uh, you know, a pack mule to do the job either. It's really simple. I'm not going to slip on where it's wet. So I'm going to go all the way to the end of the gym, but I'm going to pretend that this is all the way. Okay? I'm going to turn around. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull back on that towel. And I'm going to reveal the reason why floors are slippery. Okay? Which is the surface dust that accumulates that simply takes way too much time to put your scrubber on it every single day. Right? And we happen to be in a gym that has very little outside traffic and a lot of room before you get in here. I just dust mopped the floor, and you can see what I picked up with little to no work, literally. So I came down, I, I pull back, so I have a, a, a new line. Some products that are made, for example, you pull behind you, you can get 10 feet done maybe in one swipe. The problem is, when you turn, you're pulling on the same dirt line. This is why this is important, in my opinion, because now I have a brand new line to my towel. I'm going to go all the way down. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to turn, and you want to see this through the whole towel so you can see where I'm coming from. I'm going to pull back again on the towel. So I went all the way down to the end of the gym again. I'm going to turn. And this is where process is key. I started with the bucket on the side I wanted. I went down, turned, down, turned, down. Now I'm going to flip the towel over. Okay? So this bucket's in the way, but pretend it's the wall. I'm going to turn again, pull back. So as you see, I essentially could do this without the dust mop. And it doesn't take much longer than using the dust mop, if I wanted. Right? 
So herein lies the process that's critical. Times of the essence, right? Okay. I went down, back, down. I flip my towel. I come down, back, down. Towel shot. But I'm right next to my cleaner. I grab another towel. I do it again. And I leave the towel against the wall. I grab another towel. I do it again. I leave it there. When I'm all done, I'm going to start where I want to finish at. I'm going to go all the way around in a picture frame and push all the towels to that door. Right? And that's essentially what we use as a process. I think it's easy, efficient, doesn't sell anything. Now, a couple of questions that come up. What about the, like a speed tack where you can put Velcro on it and it's a microfiber and I can go up and down? I do like that process. The problem to it though is when I get to the end, it's immediately dirty, which means now what? Flip it and put a brand new one back in the bucket or use the same one in the same bucket. In other words, I don't get the full range as I would out of a simple towel and broom. As funny as it is that there isn't something, in my opinion, better. Um, but that, that's essentially it with that. Um, how much should you do it? Situational, based on when's the game, right? Um, when the availability and cost are there to either have contractor do it or in-house do it. Um, and use, you know? If you start to see or have people complaining about slipperiness, you, if you're on this right now, it's physically the squeak sound that we want to hear, you know? And it's dry already. There's no safety issue, right? So it's essentially a way to wipe off a huge table in a quick time with very inexpensive products, right? Now, some people will resort to, and this brings up a question in the MFMA um, that I had mentioned earlier, the use of a scrubber, okay? You really have to be careful because some products are not burnishable, meaning if you have a white pad on it and it's an oil-modified finish, chances are that you may scuff that and cause that gloss to look satin, right? We have two colleges in the immediate area, um, one that tried to overclean their main court of their huge facility, their field house, deglossed about 200 spots, right? Did it by hand, but they got the marks out, right? We have another gym that they had water-based for years, which is traditionally can at least take some abrasiveness as a, from a white pad. They got a new gym. And that new gym was oil-based, right? They used the same process on it and caused that whole floor to turn from gloss to satin in, in literally an hour. So you need to understand as a, as a cleaning company, if a floor sands their, if a company or a school rather, sands their gym and changes products, you need to know what that is, right? Um, and then just understanding that. A couple of things to talk about as well. Um, adhesives, shoe marks, things like that that are a, a, really a problem. I like to say, you know, you can go up to even a mineral spirits as far as a cleaning solvent if you had to get a mark out or, or, or an area, but always do a test spot, right? But if you have an area of concern, you can use mineral spirits. In fact, we have some case scenarios where um, we've used acetone. You need to be careful. Acetone will eat the finish in a minute, right? But if you start from the lowest, which is a neutral cleaner, then you get up to maybe a citrus cleaner, right? A little bit more abrasive chemically. You might want to wear gloves with that. Then you can maybe go up to a mineral spirits for more spot things if, if you have to. Um, tape. We all come across tape right? Um, tape is an MFMA position statement that essentially says there's not a tape made, number one, that will guarantee it won't peel finish. And there's not a finish made that guarantees that there's any tape that will work under any circumstances. But they deceive all of us by calling it floor tape or this school has it, it's worked there. That's zero relevancy. Every job is different. But the biggest reason why tape pulls isn't so much that it's pulling finish off. It's the fact that these floors expand and contract. 
you see all these gaps in these floors. It's winter now, so it's dry. And this floor is tens of years old. It's different than a brand new floor that's tight. As it expands and contracts, you essentially create little lips of finish at the ends of the boards. When you see a job where tape has peeled finish off the job, you almost always can see that it's represented or started at a gap, right? If you see a tape running with the length and it's right in the middle of a board, you'll see sometimes it won't peel the finish because it's not over a crack. But every time it gets to a butt joint, it'll peel it a little bit. So you need to understand that a little bit too from an owner standpoint. There isn't a tape, like zero tape made guaranteed to work under any circumstances ever. <laughs> and, and it's helpful to know that because almost everyone does use tape. And it's not their fault that they use tape. It's not necessarily creating a safety issue. Um, but we need to be cognizant that there's nothing we can do as professionals about the use of the tape, right? Personally, in your setting, because you, you just saw how dirty the towel got in the area I didn't use the dust mop, if you were to do that every night, it would be a night and day difference for two reasons. One is it's going to remain tackier longer for playability, but two is most marks that you see, the more a person slides, the longer that mark is, right? The more product on the floor and the more pivoting that's done, the more that gets ground in over time. So you talk about a course of a year and the thousands of plays that are made in a gym floor, especially ones where they have gym class all day and all night and school facilities and all that stuff, they're using it constantly. The more you can keep the surface dust off, the longer that gloss will retain. So that's my opinion, but does that mean you have to? I, in my opinion, honestly, this is 8,500 square feet. If I didn't do anything extra special, meaning I didn't spend a whole lot of time on marks and I was doing the process just like the dust mop, this wouldn't take me more than 15 minutes. And I mean grabbing the bucket coming out here and putting it away, okay? So when you're done, you got all these towels up in the corner, all those towels can be washed with anything. But note, you don't want to wash them with the, the dust, the mop that was used in the kitchen cleaning up the oils from the chicken right? You, you want to be cognizant of what it's being washed with because transfer of stuff into that towel can cause that towel to now be a problem when you tack your floor. There are actually gyms that have created a film um, on the floor due to that being done that way. So we like to say, you know, if you guys do the gym, keep the towels just for the gym, right? Now, funny enough, and this is a marketing thing that all the manufacturers do, this neutral cleaner, other than its drying properties being a little quicker, is almost exactly the same as a house cleaner that you'd buy, wood floor cleaner, right? It just says commercial and gymnasium on it, right? But I'll show you another little thing that may be helpful in general cleaning for school or maintenance um, that may have never been talked about before or not, I don't know. but. When we do a gym floor and we do a recoat, our guys are going to take the towel and they're going to wipe down bleachers. They're also going to wipe down, you know, pads. But what I like about it, almost every gym in America has four inch by three inch black vented cove base. And who wants to go around on their hands and knees cleaning it? Who really notices it all the time? But if you want to clean it quickly and effectively, That's a quick, easy way to get your base clean, you know? And I know it's nothing special, but you can use this product in literally anything because it's neutral. So you don't have to feel like it's gonna hurt the paint or hurt the varnish or hurt the, the vinyl or hurt the rubber. It'll work on anything. It's marketed towards wood floors, but it'll work on anything. So that's a good thing to know if you clean a gym floor and wanna you know, how long would that have taken me to do this whole gym? Five minutes, right? So you clean that off, it's a nice little extra thing to do. So, 
Um, scuffs in water-based settings, people have resorted to using a scrubber with a white pad with light pressure. Um, that is a consideration. The biggest reason, see the MFMA has basically written a position statement saying we don't recommend scrubbers, right? But they've also written position statements saying if used the right way in a refinishing process that we would allow that. But the key is age, how many coats are on it, time of year, etc. In Florida it's a little bit different than in Wisconsin. You could clean your floor, say in June, July, August, September, using the scrubber. Then all of a sudden in November, December, January, you start to see the, what's going on. It's the same process. What's going on is your floor is contracting as it's becoming dry. Your heat gets flipped on. Your floor will create small microscopic uh, cracks in the floor. And a lot of companies, and this is a position statement, are going to put in man-made expansion rows on purpose. And you'll see them. In, in equal increments across the gym floor that are there on purpose so the floor can expand and contract appropriately with the seasonal changes, right? Why is that important? You drop the water here and you, and you pick it up right here. If you're not cognizant of how many coats you have on the floor, that water can get in those cracks and infiltrate the, the grain of the wood essentially from the sides and cause the floor to prematurely slightly cup, even though it may not stay that way it can cause that to happen, and we've seen that. I actually was at a Finnish seminar here in Milwaukee with a company that used a clean and coat process that caused the whole floor to cup. I'm not gonna mention it, but a year later, that floor went back, no issues with cupping, and there was no issues with peeling or anything. But you need to be careful because that age and, and longevity and time of year is unbelievably crucial. And that's why the MFMA has essentially said, you know what? Too many variables. If, if you have a question, call, call me or call the MFMA and we'll say, yeah, you know, it's like anything. Anything will pretty much work if you do it the right way. And all the manufacturers will tell you, yeah, we don't have a problem with it as long as you follow what it says to do. But we don't all do that, right? We, we have turnover. We have time frames. We have time of year. We have all those things involved. And when you deal with that, you got to come up with, with the understanding of where you're at at the time of doing it. Okay? So to finish your question, typically a, a scrubber will work. A lot of companies will use that, on a, or schools or companies, will use that, say, more on a monthly basis where they don't do it all the time, uh, but that'll help with marks. Annual maintenance helps with marks so that it's not a way of saying, hey, just accept the marks and then every year we'll screen them off and refinish your floor. But most schools will refinish between a year and two years regardless, right? Um, depending on use and level, time of year, age, all the same variables. Um, but then the other thing would be, it just comes down to elbow grease. Using, using a tennis ball or the foot like I showed you with shoe marks. Yeah, and you know, there's no, exactly, there's no exact science on why. But you can imagine the amount of people that come in here, the amounts of different kinds of shoes, the kinds of markings that get on it at certain temperatures and humidities throughout a 12 year period, or 12 month period rather. And we'll have, and I have case examples where we'll do a screen and coat. And we have what's called a three and out method, right? So a screen and coat essentially is braiding the floor to create a physical adhesion but also to be able to clean the floor so you don't see that issue when you put finish on, right? I'm coming across the floor and I come across this little mark, if you can see it or not, and I come over it, I'm gonna heal it, which is getting the aggressive part of the screen. I'm gonna do what's called a three and out, and that's just a personal method. All of our uh, employees use the same method. If I can't get that, that mark out in three heels, you're gonna be more upset with me with the screen mark than you are me leaving the mark, right? So especially the first recoat, when a school does their first recoat, we find it extremely important to bring you in to watch me not get that mark. Because that mark wasn't there before, how come I can't get it, right? And that at least gives you the peace of mind that there is probably a 1% mark ratio, maybe less, 0.05%, um, there's no exact to it, of marks that just simply will not come out. 
and there's no exact science on it, but it's kind of like tape and residue of the tape and the adhesives, why it works and why it doesn't. There's no science. So the best we've come up with is, is somehow the, 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 the products and resins that are in the shoe sort of re-emulsify or somehow become part of the finish. And that's not an excuse to say as a contractor, I don't do due diligence. It's a way of proving to you though, hey, I, I can't get that mark and I don't know why. And keep track of those things over time, you know, that wasn't there before. So in a new gym, you shouldn't have any marks. If you can't get them out the first year, but then the second year you have a little more, then the third year you have a little more, then the fourth year you have more, and so on, they start to accumulate. And then that's, you know, traditionally gyms will re-sand to bare wood 10 to 12 years, sometimes eight years after that, you know, they're sanded or installed initially. So those are really the only methods, but um, any other questions that you have come across? Or if you're using a dust mop daily, right, I like to recommend just doing this instead because I don't think it really takes much more time, right? And I, it does, like I said, two things. It keeps players happy, but it really keeps your floor better looking longer. You know, that little bit of dust I pulled up where the dust mop already went starts to degloss this quicker than if you don't, you know, if you don't clean it. Exactly. It, it's subtle, but it's an accumulation of that that becomes the issue. So, hope it makes sense. Thank you guys for listening again today. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at 262-269-8045. Thank you very much.